All righty, MentorFest continues here at ARL North Texas. Hello, Aaron, Kilo 8, Alpha Mike Hotel. We're ready to start our next session here. Uh, Tom, November 6, Bravo Tango, is joining us with information on towers and other uh, support structures. Uh, things that I enjoy looking at and that they get the antenna up in the air, but I absolutely refuse to find. So, Tom, <laughs> thanks for joining us. We'll send it over to you. Good afternoon. Okay, good afternoon. You hearing me okay? Yeah, you're coming in loud and clear. All right. Well, I hope you enjoy this uh, opening slide there. That's a sunset uh, from our place in Northwest Arizona. The far hill there is the Western Rim of the Grand Canyon. So, a <clears throat> short bio on me. Uh, basically, I've been uh, designing and building antennas for about 30 years. <clears throat> done quite a few interesting things, but if you're more used to seeing a Gantt chart, this is uh, what I've been up to. I am the uh, founder of uh, Force 12 Incorporated. I sold that in early 2008 and then started Next Generation Antennas and also uh, finished writing uh, my book, uh, Array of Light, the third edition. And also uh, down at the bottom there, you can see quite a few antennas that we worked on over the years. <clears throat> And here we are today. Thank you very much, fellows, for this uh, great session. Uh, I've really never seen anything like it. I think it's uh, really fantastic. Towers. There are all kinds. Some you can drive on uh, mass like that, and then there are tall crank-up towers, and there are even bigger towers, ones with lots of arrays, some that rotate. If you have a drone, you can look at them from the top. Or if you don't have a drone, you can look at them from the bottom, looking up through probably hundreds of elements. <clears throat> the QTH here has got 120 acres, lots of towers, beautiful sunset. It's uh, near Eau Claire, Wisconsin. The location of W0AIH. And I took these pictures while I was over there talking with Paul and <clears throat> doing a little kibitzing with him on his big three element 80 meter beam. And unfortunately, about a year or so later, uh, he fell and was killed. So the question is, what level of experience do you have compared to Paul? And every time I climb, even on a ladder, I remind myself, I get one chance and I lose. Gravity does not give you a break. <clears throat> but why do I mention a ladder of all things? Well, there's several kinds of ladders, of course, but the key is you have a ladder on the ground and you can have a leg on the ladder sink into some unseen go for a whole ground squirrel, hole, other type of soft ground. Now, presumably, since I mentioned this, you're gonna start checking, but if you don't, you will be hurt, possibly worse. I have a good friend back in California. It's on an eight foot ladder, <clears throat> almost killed him. He's uh, paralyzed from the waist down. So check out the ground before you step on that ladder. Rooftops, <clears throat> very difficult to manage your safety, especially with ceramic tile roofing. Flat roofs, I don't mind a lot, except you still have to get up there. And if you slip or trip, it's a long way down. And do you have a safety belt holding you to anything? Probably not. So a question, why the driving force to elevate an antenna in the first place? The higher, the better. Well, why, why is that, of course? Horizontal antennas in particular, Yagi antennas, you want to achieve increased performance with directivity and gain. You want to lower your takeoff angle. So how can you elevate an antenna? Or what kind of sky hooks do we have available? Well, here's one about 50 miles from us. I drive by it once in a while. I'm sure you could get it cheap. It's about 35 feet tall, the catch is, I think you have to take it down. And I think the only way I take it down is with a Sawzall. But <clears throat> there are tripods, masts and towers. So tripods, where do you use those? Usually on a roof and the tallest tripods are probably about nine feet and they'll hold small yaggies, dipoles and things like that. And one of the keys of course is how do you secure the legs to the tower? And then you probably have to guy it too, so you'll need some guy points. There are lots of different kinds of masts. <clears throat> and these are some manual push-up kinds. You have steel, aluminum, and fiberglass. Another catch is you have to secure the base and you do need a guying system. They're generally pretty lightweight, but again, they're not for very large antennas. 
and you really cannot do one of these by yourself. There are other kinds of masts. Some of these I'm sure you've seen in the upper left corner there, the pneumatic kind uh, used by the media a lot. Uh, they're air driven. Center type, some more push-ups, but that's actually driven also, and so is the one on the lower right. So what's the issue with a tubular mast? Well, the catch is if you have a Yagi antenna up there, they don't really handle torque unless you have some kind of keyway to keep it from rotating. So <clears throat> when you're putting one of these up, you generally have to put the antennas before you extend it or push it up the rest of the way. And I get asked this fairly often, especially when we've had <laughs> expeditions and we're using Yagis. Well, we're going to put this on a 35 foot mast and push it up. Well, no, you're not. It has to do with how tall you are, what kind of base you've got, and how many people do you have uh, before you kind of Iwo Jima this antenna up. In general, you can push up about 24 feet, especially if you have a rotor up there that has a lot of weight. And of course, the major concern is the base. If you go through the physics of it all, the base is what keeps it in place so you can push it up. And a lot of people are tempted, you know, if it's a guide mast, which it most likely is, they want to pull on the guy lines. That is not a good idea. Just push it up and then secure the guys. Other kinds of heavier duty masts, you can get these up, up to about 70 feet or so. And they usually, well, many of them are motorized. They either have a manual winch or a motorized winch of some kind. Some have tilt over bases. So you can tilt the whole thing over, put the antenna on, tilt it back up. It works really good. They can be standalone. Some of them can rotate from the base. So your rotator is not up top. It's actually on the bottom. And you can bracket it to your house. These are really not uh, temporary things. These are really permanent because what do you need? Concrete. Once you put concrete in the ground, it's there a long time. As I mentioned before, unless you can tilt it over, you still have to mount your antennas before you extend the mast. And I like the kind that are tilted over, it really helps. But if you don't like climbing a tall ladder, you know, how else do you get to the top of a mast if you can't tilt it over? Well, my favorite is a man lift. You, they're also called bucket trucks and so on, or a crane. Uh, I really don't like cranes because you end up in kind of like a bosun's chair and you're blow, blown around a lot. Uh, man lifts are really a nice way to go. They come in electric, they come in propane, they come in diesel. They come on in lengths up to, believe it or not, 125 feet. Uh, those are not inexpensive, of course. And there are two general varieties. Uh, one's called a stick boom, the other is a knuckle boom. Knuckle boom has a lot more joints, very nice. Uh, flexibility there to work around the towers, get up almost anywhere. You can get some that do not be, need to be delivered because when you get one of these, like I'm in, the one I'm in there in the picture, that genie lift, genie boom, uh, there is a delivery fee to bring it to you and another delivery fee to bring it, uh, fee to bring it back. But there are some you can uh, rent that are trailerable and they usually only go up to about 30 feet or so but they're not very mobile. Once you set them, make sure that's exactly where you want it because you're not gonna be driving it around. Uh, the one that I'm in there, the Genie, uh, you can actually drive it from up there in the bucket. If you can't get in there with a man lift, you can use scaffolding. This particular place here, the tower was originally put in with a crane and then he wanted to change out his antenna. <clears throat> so. Riggs actually came over and set up the scaffolding and we put we built the antenna in place. Uh, that antenna is a big C49XR, weighs about 230 pounds. And uh, it took us a long time. We didn't finish till way after dark, but uh, we got it done without this fellow having to get another uh, permit for a crane and traffic control, you know, while the crane was out in the street. So scaffolding is another option. If you want, a real ultimate mast, as I called it. These guys can go up to 200 feet and the whole mast rotates. They were originally uh, called Bertha's, baby Bertha's, big Bertha's and so on. And they still are made today. 
very expensive. So in this case, as I mentioned, the mask can rotate the whole thing. On others, only the top section rotates, but you can climb these things. So how do you get your antennas up? Well, <clears throat> you can do a straight pull right up the mast. You can set up a tram system, or you can use a man lift or a crane. You can get a mast for less than a hundred bucks, or you can get one of these other ones way into six figures. So some of the things to include are the mast, which sometimes ends up being the smaller part of the cost, the base, if you need concrete, you have to dig the hole, you have to get concrete, guy anchors, guy lines, rotators, coax, buried PVC for the coax and all those other things. So it's important to work out your budget beforehand. All right, if you want a triangular type tower, <clears throat> this is the least expensive. It's been around a very long time. They're called BX, HDBX, and so on. They're uh, freestanding, they're usually uh, in eight foot sections and they just drop together and then bolt. They're very difficult to climb, they're, very, they're hard on my feet because you can see they're X braces, but they are available and uh, they're pretty relatively inexpensive. I think I had some that actually I took them up to 64 feet, which was pushing the limit. Very popular series is this uh, set the 25G on up to 65G. Uh, you'll see these all over a lot, a lot of times used, uh, a lot of times new, of course. Uh, most of the time they're in 10 foot sections, but the 65G can come in 20 foot sections. And if you look down at the bottom there on the right, the 20 foot 65G is merely a $1,500 price per section. Now, if you don't like steel, there are also fixed towers made out of aluminum. And I've been up on a lot of these. Uh, one of the issues with aluminum is that they do move around in the wind and a lot of times they creak. And uh, it might uh, increase your anxiety just a bit when you're up there. But you can also get aluminum crank up towers they can be straight crank ups like on the left. And there are also others that tilt over in a very complex mechanism shown in the uh, center and lower right. And of course, the strongest ones are lower. Uh, they make them up to 122 feet. Uh, that's the highest I've seen. I would say practical heights are 50 to 60 feet in that range. Now, if you wanna go higher with crank ups, of course it's steel. They usually have tubular legs and then the Z bracing, not X bracing is welded and they come in all different kinds. A lot of them up to hundred feet or more and you do need a lot of concrete in the base. This is uh, not a simple project. The uh, crank up mechanisms are either manual or motorized. An example of an 89 foot motorized tower. Uh, this belongs to a uh, W0YG in Colorado. <clears throat> Those antennas, uh, the, top, the top antenna is a two element 40. Might look kind of small, the elements are actually 58 feet, they're 85% full size. The one under it is, is a two element 80. The elements are 102 feet long and it self resonates at about 3.8 megahertz. Of course, now if you don't want to leave it at your place all the time, you can use a mobile crank up tower. They come in all kinds of trailers. Uh, these are all steel crank up towers. They're also aluminum ones. There's a whole variety. They take quite a bit to set up. And of course the price is a little on the high side, but they are very handy. So one question I get asked fairly often is, well, why don't I guy my crank up tower so I can put more load? Well, what does a guy cable actually do? <clears throat> Simple drawing here. If we look at my notes, uh, Geiger lines A, B, and C, they all add vertical thrust to the tower as the wind is coming in from the right-hand side. The tower can't move because of the guy lines and that translates into vertical thrust. So A and B add vertical thrust to the cables. So that's what's actually happening. So I better make sure if you do this, 
that your cables can take the extra weight, the extra vertical thrust. Guying uh, section C is really not much of an issue because the vertical thrust from that, because of the uh, guy lines being there, uh, that thrust goes right into the base. So speaking of bases, that 89 foot crank up tower, this is the hole you would have to dig and the rebar that you'd put inside. And hopefully this fellow uh, has a friend that's going to get him out of there. <clears throat> Once you have all the rebar done, you need to secure the base anchors. And the reason I say to secure them is when you're pouring concrete, concrete weighs, I think 3,030 pounds per yard when it's wet. That is a lot of force when that starts coming down the chute. So we have many types of supports and there is one that has found favor. It's a relatively new type, which is the rotating fixed tower. If you remember, I, we looked at the 25G, 45G and so on. Well, the original slide that I have up there is this. This is 140 feet of 55G and it's guide and it all rotates from the bottom. Sounds like a nice trick, right? Well, this is how you do that. These particular rotating guy rings are by K0XG, and there are three sets, but the bottom antenna on the array is also on an orbital rotator, or otherwise known as a ring rotator, also by the same company. So when we look at the tower here, uh, the two big tri-banders up top, they're C49XRs. There's a third one down below and he can phase them all together, but he can rotate the tower in one direction and rotate the bottom one in another direction. So if he wants to work Europe with a stack, that's fine. Then he can work South America with the bottom one. Also on this tower, there's a, a two over two on 40, one at the top, one down farther. And the lower 40 has a two element 30 interlaced with it. And then there's a 1217. Uh, just above the, the bottom big tribander, and then he's got some other antennas off to the left. If you're interested in calculating forces on your tower, uh, try K7NV. He has all kinds of uh, tools for you to use. <clears throat> but if you're interested in why would I want to stack Yagi antennas, here's a list for you. In general, you want to increase the forward gain. And it really depends on the gain of the antennas in the stack, not the boom length. I know boom length is related to gain, but it's really the actual gain from each antenna. If you have two element Yaggies like on 20 meters, you can stack them 28 to 30 feet and you'll pick up a good reasonable gain between two and a half, maybe three dB. If however, you have larger Yaggies, you need to go out to at least 50 foot spacing. And this of course impacts the, uh, your, your total tower height and where you put the antennas on the tower. <clears throat> the other reason to do stacking is that it, lobe, it combines the lobes. You have lobe combining going on. And even though there's a lot of literature from uh, times past that says, if you have an antenna one wavelength and one and a half wavelength, the effective wavelength of the stack is three quarters. That is not correct. The effective height of the stack is about 90% of the top height. Getting back to uh, Kurt's uh, software, an interesting uh, screenshot from some of his software on a guide tower. And if you look at it, the elevation on the tower there is 100 feet. And with this particular wind, I can't remember what it is, it's actually moving 18 inches and so on down the tower. So you want to put up a tower. Well, let's go down the list. What restrictions do you have? Maybe neighbors, maybe they just don't want one. Are there county restrictions, city, or of course, written CCNRs and HOAs? Another big one is, do you need a permit? I'll just let it sit there. Do you also need an engineer's drawing, particularly with a wet stamp? Sometimes those are hard to get. And I mentioned this earlier, your budget. And then how much can you do yourself? And of course, if you need an inspection, 
uh, you may not be able to do as much yourself as you think. And then point E there is your weather. You need to take into account where you live, what your winds are. If you happen to live on a slope or on the top of a hill, you will not only get straight winds like you do down in the flats, you will get uplifting winds. And the winds come up the slope of the hill, they'll actually lift your elements up in the air and then literally drop them. So the winds are much different. So now that you decided you wanted an antenna and you got a budget, one of my best suggestions is to carefully select a position and to get the best advantage of your terrain. And there are tools for you to do that. Try to keep it as far from power lines as possible where you can have access to it to not only dig the hole, uh, and by the way, uh, call USA Dig or Dig Alert, somebody like that. So you, uh, when you're digging your hole, you don't run into a power line or something, a buried power line. <clears throat> and it's nice to select a location where you don't have to use a pump to put the concrete in or to use a crane later on to get the antennas on. So try to make things as easy as possible. It'll keep your budget down. And then the last one, number five, please have enough workspace around the tower. Uh, the, <laughs> I have some other pictures later. Placing a tower against the house, that always sounds nice. It is nice after everything's up. The catch is getting everything up and then later getting it down. So additional thoughts, and I mean these to be sobering. How old are you? Who's gonna climb this tower? you or someone else got to do the initial installation and then this next one is a thing called maintenance or if you get injured and can't climb anymore and what are you going to be like in 10 or 20 years because your tower is still going to be there and i have got gotten this question more than once where can you go for training on tower work the only place I know is a tower manufacturer that, and they will train their own employees. I don't know that they will train anyone else. So usually where you'll find out is you hire someone to do the work and you watch and see what they do. And hopefully you can learn from them. So along with figuring out where to put the tower and so on, deciding what kind of operating you wanna do, what bands you wanna operate on, and how high you really want the antenna and maybe you can't get it as high as you want. So there are a lot of things that you need to consider. This next series, you may not run into, but on the other hand, you might. This particular tower, uh, I've replaced a rotator in it three times because of the load. It happens to be near the crest of a hill and the winds are really tough. So how do you change the rotator on this thing? First of all, you've got a two, in, a two inch quarter inch wall mast. It's about 25 feet tall. It's very heavy. That big uh, 80 meter beam weighs uh, over 200 pounds. Plus you have other stuff there. And if you think about the rotator, your mast is sitting on top of the rotator. The rotator is actually taking the majority of the weight, if not all of the weight from the mast and the antennas, even if you have a thrust bearing at the top. So how do you do this safely? Well, we're in a 65 foot man lift. And the first thing we did was we put on three safety cables. Uh, you can see them there going around the mast. They're to keep the mast centered. But before we did that, we had to get rid of the clamshells. Clamshells are the things, you know, that hold the mast. Uh, they're hooked, they're bolted, of course, to the rotator torque plate, and then they hold the mast. So we had to get rid of that first. So it sounds easy, you know, just lift everything up, but it isn't. The, the problem with this was the bolts were all rusted. Uh, these big two clamshells are very heavy. So the only way we got them off <clears throat> was to use a grinder with zip disks. And of course we cut into the uh, clamshells because there was no way else. Fortunately, the replacement rotor had a new set. So after you get that all done, then you can start attaching three come-alongs and they're bolted <clears throat> to the, 
to the mast above those three uh, securing cables. I made a note here without reading all this stuff. You see the red arrow. You can see kind of a worn area, and there is a, a thing that looks like an upside down V there. Well, that V block is what centers the mast onto the torque plate, the rotor torque plate, and puts the, mat, the mast right in the center. Problem is, <clears throat> if the mast rotates a little bit in the clamshells, there's a quarter 20 bolt going through that and it ends up loosening. And that's a bad thing because that V block ends up rotating and I'll tell you what happens next. So here we now have the three come alongs and they are clamped. As I mentioned, we're on a 65 foot man lift and we take each one and put it up in the leg of the tower. And then Bill and I, we do one click at a time. And this is really heavy lifting. As I mentioned, you got the mast, you have all the antennas and a little bit of what I call unwanted friction. Word to the wise, before you use a come along like this, where there's going to be a tremendous force on them, make sure you know how to release them so you can lower it back down. Not all come alongs work the same. I put a note there, this is heavy lifting, just to remind us again, I'm 6'1", Bill's about 6'5". So now we have the rotator and you can see where that V block is spun around. So why is that? Well, this is it. Uh, that little quarter 20 bolt goes through the top, through the torque plate, and it holds a main drive gear in place. When it loosens up, the drive gear drops down and disengages and the rotator doesn't work anymore. So we put everything back together, put our own bolts in, and it's still running. There's a, a comment here in red on this slide. Check the ground under your tower. Uh, things do loosen up. In this particular case, the bolts actually fell out of the bottom of a rotator. This is a different tower. And the remaining bolts <clears throat> were a little bit loose. And the rotator's moving around a little bit. They elongated the holes really uh, destroy the rotator shelf and other things. So why do you want a tower? Here we go. Casual operating chasing DX, contesting HF or VHF, UHF. So at VHF, of course, your selection is generally not as complex because the antenna or the antennas and tower do not have to be as high. Unless of course you're doing EME, you know, moon bounce, that's kind of a different ball game. So where are we in the sunspot cycle? This has a lot to do with what antennas you might want to put on there for HF. Possible openings, if you want to work DX, are going to be on the lower bands, 40, a lot of good stuff on 80, uh, 20. So probably 20 and 40 would be the best bands for a Yagi. So the bottom line for antennas at HF. Try to use some software. I mentioned terrain before. There's some software called HFTA, High Frequency Terrain Analysis. You can actually find your terrain and run this software to see what the angles come out uh, for your particular target zones. Now, here's a fellow that uh, used this and really optimized this whole array, K7RL. Uh, you, you could probably uh, look up his website there and see exactly what he did. There's also software like this. Uh, for propagation to help you out, uh, K6TU. And HFTA, put in just a couple screenshots here, which shows you, and this is comparing, this is not put up yet, but uh, this is two 20 meter stacks, not that we can all do this. One's at 118 feet and 50 feet, one's at 110 feet and 30 feet. You may not think that makes much of a difference, but it does if you look at the red and blue tracks over there, this is to Europe. And then this is to Japan. So if you wanna work a lot over to Asia, you may wanna do the red setup, which is 110 and 30 feet instead of the other. And the terrain profile is on the lower right. Uh, sorry, I didn't point it out on the prior slide, but it's there also, it's a real steep slope. <clears throat> now there are some other propagation modes you can run into at HF. There's Cordal Hop or Peterson Way, particularly on 40 meters. And even if you have an antenna uh, 
at fairly low heights, like 40 feet, uh, you can enjoy that. So let's put up a tower. <clears throat> and please take this to heart. Only trained, experienced, qualified, certified, and insured professional tower installers should ever attempt the installation, service, or dismantling. Try to employ a local professional engineer if you can. And all safety is your responsibility. So how do you put up a tower? Well, if you're trying to do it at field day, you could use this. It's a fellow from uh, Central Valley, uh, N6RK, it's called a Falling Derrick. There are other uh, YouTubes of this besides his. And this is back from quite a few years ago. He actually uh, used this at home. So it goes like this. The Derrick keeps going down, pulling the tower up. And there you go. Then he puts the antenna up and he's using a hazer. Now a hazer, if you're not familiar with that, it actually uh, goes up and down the side of the tower. So you can crank that hazer all the way down with the antenna and rotator on it. And then crank it back up so you do not have to climb the tower. Now, if your primary interest is working 40 meter nets, now you're probably mostly in Texas or, or nearby. That's a great space, a place to do this because you can work east and west. You got most of the US about the same distance away. So you can utilize NVIS antennas, near vertical incidence sky wave. And this is basically the way it works. It's a very low antenna for 40, uh, puts out a ground wave, of course, but the key is it radiates at very high angles. They just bounce up and down and you get very good contiguous coverage. This is the one that uh, the XYL Vicky uses and six KLS. Uh, we're up here, as I mentioned, Northwest Arizona. It's 18 feet high. It's 38 feet long, coil loaded. It gives her contiguous coverage from East Texas all the way west to uh, Washington State. Now, if you're trying to work DX and you're having trouble, this may be the reason. I believe uh, these pictures are from Panama. And power lines and other things, sometimes, you know, people just can't hear you because they have local problems. So mass and towers, of course, can be a major expense, but what if you want to find a used one? So here's uh, myself and, and a good friend of mine, Evan N6BXL, we're taking down a tower, taking the mast out first and we're using a knuckle boom, a very useful tool. A lot of times towers are available when someone's moving or downsizing or from an estate. So how do you know a tower is safe? What you see is not always what you get. Tubular steel towers rust from the inside out, not from the outside in, and it's difficult to test. There are some towers made of solid rod, not tube. You also wanna check the bottom legs, particularly in areas where it, can, where it freezes, because if you have water inside a tower leg and it freezes, what does what water do when it freezes? It expands and it will actually crack and split the bottom leg of the tower. I have actually repaired a few of those. I thought I'd put this in here because I get asked a lot, <clears throat> well, what's a good QRP antenna? So what's the difference between a QRP antenna and a non-QRP antenna? The answer is nothing. And actually, if you QRP, you should have a better antenna than if you're running higher power. If you have lightning in your area, please look this up. It's called UFER or UFER. Uh, there's a website there from uh, ecmag.com, and this is basically the way it works. It utilizes uh, rebar in concrete to uh, dissipate the lightning strike. So here we are putting up a tower. This is at our place in Arizona. First of all, we needed Bubba and his dog, <clears throat> well, and his excavator, of course. So uh, first antenna or tower we were putting in was our antenna research test tower. It's a 54 foot crank up. This ground was really easy. His bucket's three feet across. I think it took him five minutes and the tower ends up like that. Of course, we didn't do this in one day. This is after we put everything together. Then uh, we went out to the front area to dig another tower. This is a two section heavy duty crank up for some other testing. He can only get down about four feet. And so I said, well, okay, if we can't go that deeper, we'll have to go bigger. And if you can see, it's lifting his uh, excavator off the ground there. The ground out there is really like a rock. 
The third tower, this is uh, Vicky's tower to motorize 54. This took him about 10 minutes to do. So make sure you know what the ground is like and make the uh, holes appropriate. As far as the bases go, uh, we, we have all kinds of welding equipment. So we weld things together. Uh, you can be tied with wire and they drop in the hole. Uh, we carry some antennas around with a tractor. So we're, this is the antenna going up on Vicky's tower. And there we are assembling the tower on the ground. And then I'm up there and I'm using a, uh, a power winch. And so I literally press the button and the antenna comes up to me. I've already put up a 40 meter rotatable dipole and I'm just pressing the button, the antenna's coming up and then I'm dropping it into a cradle mount. As I mentioned, tractors are very handy, <laughs> really good for moving bases around. A couple details when you're putting up a tower like this. You put one bolt on each side for it to pivot on as you tilt it up. Now there is a fixture already attached to the front. Make sure you cut the retaining straps if it's a new tower. <clears throat> this particular one has uh, an alpha spin rotator which has a much different mounting system. It's a nice rotator, but just be aware it, it doesn't work uh, with a standard uh, rotator shelf. This also has uh, uh, tower section locks. And these are the lock controls. You pull down, of course, the tower's off on the side, but you, you pull those knobs, <laughs> in this case, over to the left, and it puts a lock in and secures the section. <clears throat> so the raising fixture is attached. We're ready to crank it up. Uh, we have a gadget called the tower dolly, just to uh, help moving the tower around. It's very handy. So here we go, just cranking the tower up. And then you always love it when you get past 45 degrees and because everything's easy. And then you get it, put it in the back bolts and it's break time. But look at the back part, the back flange there, uh, where that white arrow is. That's a very important piece because as the tower uh, drops down, that piece will stop it from going too far. If it goes too far, you're going to have to somehow push it back to get a bolt in and secure it. Uh, if you have really tough weather, uh, you're probably not near salt air. Uh, in particular, uh, tower in Aruba here, as you can see, it really rusts. And this other one is also in the Caribbean. <clears throat> the uh, has very shallow guy angle. They obviously did not have enough property. I wanted to include this picture. It's the most difficult tower I ever worked on. I had to climb up the tower, transferred to the roof, go around on the roof and get back on the tower and climb back up. Plus there were other antennas on the roof that I had to work around. So you need to really plan everything very carefully. And the tower climber is the one in authority, not the ground crew. And what a lot of people on the ground don't realize is that when you're on the tower, you hear a lot more than someone on the ground. You'll hear traffic noise, you'll hear all kinds of things. So if you're on the ground, you have to you know, look up when you're talking, make sure everyone knows uh, what you're saying and that you can hear the tower climber. Also make sure your ground crew knows how to tie knots that you can undo later. This tower is pretty much right against the house. And this is a very tough job but I'm um, putting up another uh, 40 meter dipole and a Yagi and looks nice when it's done, but it was very difficult. Now, if your tower has a manual uh, handle on the winch, you do not have to leave it there. Uh, you can take the bolt off and turn it around so the handle's not sticking out or just leave the handle off if you're not gonna uh, use it very often. And remember, are you sure you want the climb? I've had a couple instances that I noted here, uh, one in particular, I was up at 90 feet with a fellow who wanted to go up there. We're working on a big 40 meter beam and he's got his brand new fall arrest system. So we get up there at 90 feet and he says, can you tell me if I'm hooked up? So I said, sure, let go. <laughs> well, he wouldn't let go. And so for the next three hours, he was holding onto the tower with one hand. So make sure you want to climb and make sure you know how to operate your equipment. These two pieces, uh, 
are just invaluable to me. Uh, one's a power ratchet. That there's another larger version available and a chain vice grip. When you need to rotate a mast <clears throat> with the rotator, particularly in the wind, or if you need to rotate a boom, you'll love that chain vice grip. Another kind of tower uh, that we make, or this is actually an old one I made. We make them out of square aluminum, they're crank up. And the reason it's in here is those four things in the lower right, those are called rigid guys. And instead of actually guying something with line of whatever kind, uh, these are rigid. And so they work in both compression and tension. A very simple method if you need to put up like a 20 foot mast is this. Uh, uh, Vicki is the uh, trustee of our D star system, uh, W7 KDS. And so the antennas look like this. Uh, the top one's 1 1.2 gigs, it's 70 centimeters and two meters. And it starts life as a 20 foot tall, two inch steel mast. It's thin wall, I think it's like it was 60. We put it 18 inches in the ground inside a two inch PVC sleeve with about a half a sack of fence post concrete. And then out the top is uh, one and three quarter inch aluminum that kind of telescopes inside. But then the key is it's held together by two lengths of five eighths rebar. So you actually have a triangle. The upper drawing there shows you that if you're using a uh, cable, uh, if the wind's coming from the left, you know, that one guy on the windward side is tight. The other one can be fairly loose. If you're using rigid guys, it doesn't matter where the wind's coming from. So uses up very little space and it's plenty strong to hold those up. A couple more shots. <clears throat> we uh, heat up the rebar with a torch and bend it so it kind of conforms to the tube or where it's going to be attached. We also have one on our uh, Azel mount. Uh, these are a little bit different because <clears throat> they, they bolt uh, to a retaining wall, but the same, same principle and they've worked really good. A few antennas at uh, N6 Auro out in Brentwood. Brentwood, I helped put those up many, many moons ago, but I did have an opportunity to uh, visit a new tower going in uh, a couple hours east of here. Uh, as I mentioned about selecting uh, your location, uh, Tim did a really good job of picking uh, five acres here with great takeoff views. And he has uh, places for storage while everything is being constructed. And what do you need? Well, you need antennas, <clears throat> more antennas, more antennas, and still more antennas, and more antennas. Oh, and an extra motorized crank up tower. But what's he putting up? He's putting up three 130 foot 65G towers. Uh, in the foreground here is one of the guy anchors. May look simple, but it really isn't. His tower bases are 12 by 12 by five. You would like them to have been deeper than five, but he ran into rock. So each of these has 27 yards of concrete. It's really a, a nice job. It's really just sanitary. But uh, the sections uh, have flange mounts and they have to be uh, put in with a crane, there's no way you can lift these. So the guy anchor, as I mentioned, looks simple, but it isn't. And of course, there are three of these for each tower. And each one has about four yards of concrete. And then uh, where the shadow is, is where the radio building goes. It's now in place. I haven't taken new shots. But while he was putting it all up, he put up a, a temporary uh, antenna there just to stay on the air. And then he put his uh, towers in a triangle, which is a good thing you might think about doing because he can uh, run 160 meter antennas uh, on catenaries between the uh, three towers. It has to do with planning. So if you take a look at his budget, here you go. <clears throat> Not including labor, uh, those towers were about $63,230. Of course, then you need the crane climber hardware, you need rotators at 2,500 apiece coax, PVC, the radio room, all the gear, <laughs> storage boxes, and so on. So it's good to know uh, your budget and know that you're covered. So let's remember, the future of amateur radio is the youth. You know, our average age keeps going up every year. Let's try to bring it down a little bit. Uh, this was from, uh, uh, what was it called? Schools on the Air. 
can't remember what, what the actual name was. It was a lot of fun. We'd go over to schools. This was an elementary school and they'd be on the air all day. So an old picture of me setting up for an antenna test and a couple thoughts for the day. Everything works and nothing's obvious. So a parting thought with today's technology, and this really comes from the prior presenter, setting up a remote station is feasible and even sharing an existing one is too. A few uh, kudos to the pictures. And thank you very much for your attention. Uh, array of light is the key word. I think I should have stopped in the middle <laughs> to <laughs> oh, mention that. You're quite all right, Tom. No, no worries. Yeah. We'll go ahead and we'll open that up now real fast. And then uh, if you also have questions, feel free to put them in the chat. So let me open up oh. the, um, okay. the entry form and uh, put the, the door prize key phrase up on the screen. So array of light is what you need to enter in this one. So again, for folks that are joining us for this session here, uh, we are giving away door prizes and, and we'll tell you what the door prize is from this session. It's a little special um, once we once we announce the winner here in a little bit. So let me start the 10 minute timer. I've got the, the form open. Click the link in the description to enter and um, you've got 10 minutes and then we'll close, uh, close off entries and then um, we'll work to select the, the winner for, for this session's door prize. So uh, again, questions, please put them in the chat. I kind of, I will say that, you know, living in a bunch of uh, association <laughs> places, I don't get to think about this. I just get to dream that, oh gosh, it would be so nice if I could put a tower up <laughs> and make all my neighbors hate me or something. But um, yeah, I, I've seen, um, like when the cellular company comes in and wants to put in a tower, sometimes they actually bring in a helicopter and the helicopter lifts, lifts the things up and puts it in place. Is that common, a common method in amateur radio or like what are the you know, antenna party time? What are some good ways to, to actually get the tower up? Um, I, I put in one tower with the helicopter. It is not very, uh, it's pretty rare, mm. mainly because you have to clear your flight path with usually the sheriff. You also have to have insurance and the sheriff will go and evacuate all the people in the flight line. Oh my. Uh, the other, the other issue is that there's a lot of static up on the blades of the helicopter. So they will often have a ground crew to, uh, ground everything that you're putting up there. So it's really not a simple thing. Uh, usually, uh, cranes are, if you're putting up something really big like that, a crane is what you would use, or big tram lines. Okay, excellent. Well, trying to see if we can get questions in the chat, but not yet. <laughs> so, okay. uh, it's, uh, I will say for, for me, though, it was a real eye opener. You know, when I hear folks say, well, I'm going to go climb the tower, I think, okay, well, they put on their safety harness and, you know, hard hat and safety, and up they go and safety. And when they're done, down they go and safety. And it's like there's a whole lot to think about uh, more more than I had thought of. So, you know, for me, and well, I'm sure for many of us here, thank you much for, for the insight. I know I appreciate it much. Well, what, one, of, one of my towers was an 89 foot crank up, and I'd just been doing work on it. <clears throat> and I'd taken all my safety things off. I'm standing right by, it was motorized, and I ran the motor, and I'm watching it go up. It gets all the way up, and the top cable, I looked at it, and it's vibrating. And next thing I know, the tower is down. The whole thing crashed right in front of me. It actually knocked some of the uh, welded braces off. I got hit in the chest with a couple pieces. Oh my. And that that's a, uh, it kind of makes you wonder uh, <laughs> what would have happened if I had been any closer. Mm -hmm. But I, I look at a crank up tower, it's actually a big meat cleaver. And uh, as I mentioned, uh, gravity will not give you a break. Once something starts going, you will not stop it. True that. All righty, well, no questions in the in the chat, just some comments. It was an outstanding presentation and uh, one comment that okay. uh, you're a great book. I'm glad someone's saying that. Um, hint, hint. Uh, <laughs> so. Oh, I do, I do have a comment for you. Is this Steve or Aaron? It's Aaron, yeah. Okay. Well, if you want antennas for small places, I actually have another presentation for that. <laughs> All righty, good teaser. Maybe for next MentorFest, uh, Steve, take a note, please. I'll I'll take one as well. So, 
Alrighty, Tom. Well, thank you much. Appreciate you joining us here. Uh, okay. For MentorFest. You take care there. And uh, yeah, okay. you, you've got my attention for the smaller, being in an association. <laughs> yeah. Okay. Stealth and smaller. And yes, please. <laughs>